Okay. So uh, today's lecture is going to begin with a uh, discussion of techniques for collecting data within any logic, uh, and then uh, getting input data and outputting data within any logic. This relates to um, observational processes, as we called them with ODD, the collecting of data, the notion that there's a lot of processes within age-based models which are aimed at making things happen endogenously within the model, you know, uh, uh, choreographing the, um, or, or allowing the, the uh, behavior to play out over time in a way that gives rise to emergent patterns, right? Um, but um, there's another set of processes which I used the term previously epiphenomenal in the sense that they are observing what's going on even though they're not influencing it. And an example of those processes are, are processes that collect data. They sort of systematically go through the model and, and collect data of the sort that needs to be reported. Right? They're not governing, they're not dictating the evolution of the system itself but they are part of the computational apparatus, so to speak, of the model um, as a whole. So they, in other words, are part of the processes that are, that are operating there. And then we're going to be talking about, so that's the collecting of data. And we're going to be today speaking about concentrating on, on one type of that. Um, but I'll, I'll mention some, some additional types. And then we'll be going to be talking about outputting and inputting data. So this is what we call traditionally I.O., input, output. How do you get data into the model? How do you, how do you get it out of the model? Because often, you know, the model's just the beginning. Uh, running the model's the beginning. You get out some emergent patterns. You get out some reports. And then you want to analyze those and figure out, for example, how do they change when you change parameter values. How do they change when they change assumptions? Different what-if scenarios will lead to changes in those results. And often the first step of that is, is running a simulation and exporting data from it. Okay? Um, now, uh, as we'll see in the next, next couple class sessions, um, we'll also be talking about running the model many times because there's, there's stochastics. And, and to develop confidence, you've really picked up a pattern of substance, a pattern that's meaningful, you really want to um, run the model many times over. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, that's what our focus is going to be for the first half of uh, today. For the latter half of today, um, I have two tutorials on Java, um, elements of Java, and um, those are going to provide a lot more detail about certain components of Java that could be useful for um, when you're putting together or trying to understand code. Okay, and so I'm going to be recording those as well for people to have reference to. Okay, so um, the observation here is that a frequent modeler need, and attempting to say ubiquitous modeler need, is to record some components of model state over time. So. So we have the model evolve, the model um, as a whole evolving. We have these agents, we have perhaps a global environment, and over time it's evolving. And we often want to have some sort of record of that evolution so that we can retrospect on it. We can go back and look at it later without rerunning that whole model. We want to be able to go back, learn from it on a cross scenario basis often. Okay? So um, frequently, uh, this is a uh, beginning of an extensive form of analysis, but typically we want to be able to have recourse to that data, all the more so because these models are expensive to run. In comparison with, a, say, a classic system dynamic stock and flow model, which might require seconds to tens of seconds to run, there are exceptions, but many models run within that time frame fast enough to be interactive. Here we might have model runs for larger populations that require minutes, hours, in some cases a day to run. And so it's particularly important to record data from this model. Now, any 
Logic does provide for certain versions of it recording of data sets to files automatically. Um, those versions are not available universally. Any Logic professional, for example, carries a fair price tag with it. Uh, we're using AnyLogic University. I'll have to check for this version if there is support. But I'm going to show you a way that you can record the data from data sets yourself anyway. So you don't have to worry about whether it's built in or not. It's a little bit of a convenience if it's built in. But fundamentally, you're going to be able to record these results uh, one way or the other. So what AnyLogic does allow for is definition of what are called data sets that record values. They're they're responsible for recording data on what's going on in the model, what's transpiring in the model. And um, we're going to be introducing data sets today, talking about statistics, which are a formally recognized way in any logic to collect information on a collection of agents, a population of agents. And then we'll see how we report on values that are collected either in statistics or data sets using graphs and tables. Okay? And you could see some illustrations of this within the sample models I've provided, but hopefully this should give you a hands-on feel for how these things work. So we're going to be going through today um, a set of different ways in which you can glean data from your model as it's running. And these techniques are going to span the gamut. They're going to run in a spectrum from very ad hoc exports, such as you might do from a variable based on a spur of the moment desire to, to see how different things are changing, a particular thing is changing, to things which require identification long before and even creation of external storage mechanisms like databases to record the results. Okay? Um, now, most of you folks have made considerable use of, of Bensim, um, perhaps PowerSim or uh, Stella I think, Berkeley Madonna, other tools like that. And what you'll find is that those tools um, generally offer a greater measure of, of uh, built-in support for recording data and flexibility because of that to, to retrospect on your data. Um, here, what we're going to be talking about is often pre-planning, such as for these later components, pre-planning what you're going to be saving away, so that when you run the model, it's saving away those things. And you've got to be conservative when you do that to, to save away data on things you might look at. And you're going to have to balance between how much data you save away on the one hand, and you know, how much flexibility you want to, to go back and look at certain data later, okay? So um, we're going to be walking this line between sort of what we can do flexibly and what, what requires pre-planning pre here. Okay, so um, of all these techniques, um, the pre-planned ones uh, generally are going to require uh, consideration up front of exactly what you'll be saving away. And typically you want to periodically report the data that you'll be saving away. So maybe every time unit, so maybe it's the time unit is a day, the time unit is a week, every time unit you'll be saving away certain types of data from the model, certain quantities. And often these quantities, not often but not always, these quantities are summaries across the data. So the model may be operating at an individual level. Agents are sending each other information, moving around this very large spatial, um, spatial extent to the model, communicating over networks. But what you may be saving away is more akin to the high level stocks and flows that you'd be accumulating within a, a stock and flow model. So you know, if we had an infection spread model, maybe what you'd be saving away is the number of susceptible and number of recovered, number of um, infective individuals, and maybe the number that have gotten infected in the last time you know, so the number of recent infectees, for example, so that you have some sense of the flows. So often we'll be storing away things that are akin to the stocks and the flows uh, at an aggregate level. They're just being computed at a much lower level. But beyond that, you want to think about storing away information that's metadata data about 
the sort of data that un gives you context for the data that you're saving, saving what. And this metadata could include the model version that was used to produce it, what precise version ID was used for that model so that you can go back and reproduce that, parameter assumptions that were used, so you want to save away data about what was the what if scenario essentially being used here so that when you look at the results, you know what they were resulting from, what, what assumptions, right? And what was the intention and in, in a sort of high level way? Why did you make, why did you run the simulation in the first place? What motivated you to run the simulation? Um, that often is a, is a good cue later to try to, um, clue you in as to what to look for in the data. What is it that you were seeking to find out? For example, maybe it was, you know, how um, infection spreads in the context of a uh, highly contagious um, uh, highly contagious illness, or what if uh, we were to lower contact rates to a very small amount. Recording your intention can be really, really useful. What you'll see is that when it comes to databases, Storing, this information is often stored separate from the data itself. So we'll have data stored every time step from the model. And this da data doesn't have to be stored every time step. It's just stored from the entire scenario. Okay? Um, and then you want to think carefully about what you want to save away for from, from data from the model, particularly intermediate data. Okay, so what we're going to be doing in today's session, like in many previous sessions, is going through an actual model and uh, interacting with it and seeing how we can save away data, et cetera. So I'd like you to open up a sample model, the SIR agent based calibration model, okay? Um, so uh, there's uh, a model here. So if you get um, help and uh, example models, you should be able to find uh, SIR agent based calibration. And because I have mine open right now, I'm gonna close it up. Um, and uh, we'll go through this together. Okay, so uh, go through here and uh, SAR agent based calibration. Not the SIR agent based this time, but conversion. Okay, um, so uh, I loaded that in here. And what I'd like you to, um, what I'd like to do first is to look at ad hoc methods for, for data. So these methods have the virtue have the, of, of flexibility. They have the attractiveness that we don't have to pre-plan what we're looking at. Instead, we can decide at, on an ad hoc basis what information we want to gather, okay? So what I'd like you to do here is to add an experiment, okay? Um, so you do new experiment, and you can call it simple experiment is what I will call it. And then I'd like you to um, save, uh, do save as the model, okay? Um, and uh, so here what we'll do is we'll, we'll add an experiment um, and I'm gonna name it simple experiment. Experiment, um, this says copy models from, yeah, that's fine. Um, and I did uh, okay here. And then I think I'd suggested here, whoop, um, uh, saving, saving the model using save as. Okay, so file, um, okay. So it still doesn't allow me to, uh, to save, save as. Um, okay, well that's fine. Um, it's interesting, I'd have to figure out why that is. It's not allowing that. And then I'd like you to run the experiment, okay? So you can do it, uh, of course, by right-clicking on it and doing run. Okay, so um, this thing should uh, should call up a um, call up a window here. And if we run it, we run it. What you'll see is a bunch of variables here. And I'd like you specifically to click on this n infectious variable, okay? That's up here. And what you'll see is there's some data in it. Um, but you'll see moreover that there are some additional um, elements here at the top of this window. This gives the current value of the number of infectious individuals. Um, but uh, in addition to that, you'll see that there's some additional little widgets there. 
And uh, what I'd like you to do is to click on the one that looks like a small graph, okay? So it's this one here. Um, and you may have to uh, drag it open, but okay, so I'm gonna have to start this thing running again. And what you'll see is a, is a small, small graph like this. And you see it's actually etching out the trajectory. I believe this is the point where the graph um, was started. And it's etching out a, a subsequent trajectory here. Um, so uh, it shows the maximum value here, for example. And you'll notice it's scrolling, scrolling over uh, here and sort of compressing it. It's actually not scrolling off the screen so much as just compressing it um, from, uh, from this earlier time to this, uh, to this later time. So if we right click on this and we do copy, I'd like you now to call up Excel. Um, and uh, once you've got Excel open, I'd like you to do a paste. So I'm gonna do this here. And now I'm gonna do a paste and, whoops. And what you'll see is that it pastes uh, two columns. Uh, the first one being time, the second one being uh, the value at that time. You'll notice that these times are not equally spaced. Um, they're based on the vagaries of when events are happening in the model. Um, but it does give you a way of, of recreating the, uh, uh, the graph. And of course, using Excel's tools, uh, for example, we could do a, uh, a scatter plot here uh, and, and draw a graph here um, of, is that similar? Uh, similar to what we see, excuse me, um, what we see here. So this is an ad hoc um, export of data. Um, the graph uh, gives you some sense of the, uh, you know, visually as to what's going on. And then the, um, uh, the capacity to export it provides a way of, of, of saving it away. Um, you'll notice that you can also here uh, go and, and click on um, click on this uh, variable and actually change it. So if you notice here, there's a, there's a variable and uh, we, what we had formerly looked at was this graph of it. But if you click on this small, um, this small little pen, you can actually interactively set the value of the variable. For example, resuming, uh, resuming infection. Um, from that point. So uh, that's just a, a, a pointer there. Um, okay, so we saw how that's um, copied into Excel and we could stop, we can stop the execution. So that's an uh, ad hoc export. And in fact, um, there's a variety of variables which support this. Uh, this is one type, that's a standard variable. You'll also see that there's this d thing called D or data set, which um, is also um, available for viewing. Uh, and uh, as, as before, you can copy from it and you can go into Excel and, and, and paste here. So um, there are several types of variables that allow you, uh, allow you to do this. So this is ad hoc, no pre-planning needed. Certain types of variables will support this sort of um, um, on the fly requesting of data, copying it and pasting it externally. We're now gonna talk about, so with that sort of exposed to you, we're now gonna talk about pre-prepared pre methods. And these pre-prepared methods are the ones to which I was orienting, I probably should have organized this slightly, uh, slightly better, but it was towards that that I was orienting these cross-method tips. Um, specifically this issue of saving away metadata and this issue of um, needing to periodically record data. For these pre-planned methods, you're going to have to be thinking ahead of time, what am I recording? How frequently am I recording? How frequently am I sampling this from the model? And what particular values am I, am I sampling? And then you want to have some documentation of you know, what model run gave rise to this. The model version, parameter assumptions, and, and the intentions behind it. We are going to take a look at two 
very flexible ways of collecting statistics or easy, easy to use ways of collecting statistics on model population on the one hand and charting it out within the model. Okay? So while we've just seen a way for some variables we can request ad hoc graphs, the charts will provide a way of, of combining together graphs of several quantities. Um, closely defining what the, very, what the time ranges are for those, the scales, what have you. Um, and uh, statistics will provide us a way of, of easily specifying what data to collect on a population. Okay, so statistics and charts actually go together very well. Often charts will be based on statistics, so I have a slide here which, which talks um, about statistics, particularly thinking about, about charting. Um, when we have populations of agents, which is typical within our model, um, we can define a, a, quant uh, a construct known as a statistic in any logic. It's actually a, a method that's defined behind the scenes, um, the way any logic implements it. But its job is to calculate values, to count up the number of agents that have certain properties, or to, um, uh, or to compute the, the average of some quantity over the population, maybe the average age of the population, maybe it's the average numbers of times people have gotten infected or what have you. Uh, and with these statistics, there's a set of kind of uh, operators that you can use. Maximum, minimum, averages, and sums, or totals of the population that can be used to define the statistic. And moreover, you can have criteria defined for counting the number of individuals that match some predicate, that match some criteria, match some condition. And it will take care of, of handling the actual counting process. And these statistics are defined with the population. So they, when, when you have the population, you add statistics to it that then allow other elements of the model, like data sets and like charts, to count these things up. So defining a statistic, this is important, defining a statistic does not itself mean that statistic is computed. You define it and then you can call that statistic to compute it from other places in your program. And it's then that it will be used. Okay? So I'd like you to select people here. So within this model, there's a, a, a people in the population. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to go to Maine here and there's a people in the population and what I'd like you to do is go to the statistics tab okay uh, and you'll notice there's an add statistics okay so if you do add statistics um, it will prompt you with a little bit of a form um, that uh, uh, that will ask you, okay, what sort of statistic do you want to include? So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to have a, a statistic that counts up the number of people with an attribute. I distinguish two broad types of statistics here, and we'll see this played out in the interface. One that counts the number that match some predicate. The other that, that uh, forms some, uh, puts some, applies some operator across the population, a maximum, an average, or a sum. And what we're going to be looking at first is the count type, okay? So within here, we're going to fill in uh, a couple pieces of information. The first is the name. And I think I'm going to name it uh, count infective, okay? Um, or count recovered. Let's do count recovered, okay? Um, count recovered. Okay, so um, uh, this is going to count the number of people recovered. And you'll notice there's types here. Um, Conceptually, there's really the first is different than the others in the sense that the count uses the condition, the other three use the expression. So conceptually, this the first one is different than the other four. So count, we have a condition we have to fill in, a condition that's going to be the criteria for whether or not someone is counted. If it returns true, they are counted. If it returns false, they will not be counted. Okay, so. In order to specify a criteria, we're going to want to use a criteria that distinguishes whether or not the person is recovered. So 
I have it done in the slides here for a slightly different criteria, whether or not the person is, is, in, is um, susceptible, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it here for recovered since we've already named it. And so we have the state chart, and you'll notice in the state chart, there's three states, susceptible, infectious, recovered. I want to check the, the, the spelling of recovered here. So the condition here will be, okay, yeah. Um, it's an any logic bug that sometimes crops up. Okay, so there's a condition here. And you'll notice there's this little flag here. And what it's telling us is item here is going to refer to, it says embedded object. What that means is embedded person in the population or agent in the population. So item here, we're gonna specify a condition for each person and when we're building up that condition, which is going to be a Java expression, and I'll define that term more precisely later today, that expression is going to use the word item to refer to the current agent. That, that expression has to apply to each agent in turn to see if that agent is eligible for being counted, right? If that agent is worthy of counting, if that agent uh, matches the criteria. So we need to refer to the agent to get information from it, and we do so with item, okay? So we're gonna specify here condition, and because we're specifying condition, it's a Boolean expression. It's gonna return true or false. So what we're gonna say is item dot state chart. Item is a reference to the agent here. Um, and here it's going to be a state chart. It knows it's actually a person here because it's people holds persons. So item dot state chart, that's items state chart. In other words, this is a reference to some person and we're saying, give me your state chart, okay? It hands back a reference to the state chart. It says, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. And then you do, is state active, okay? That's a way of asking, okay, Tell me whether or not a certain state is active. And what we're gonna have to say here is person dot recovered. In other words, the recovered with respect to person. Persons recovered. That's the recovered associated with the person class as opposed to the recovered associated with the deer class or something like that. It's just not smart enough to know there's only one of them. So um, this is gonna be our criteria. So for a given person who's named item, this criteria is going to say whether or not they're comfortable. Right? If their state chart has an active state that indicates they're recovered, they will count as being recovered. Otherwise, no. This is going to return true or false. Any question about that? Sorry? Oh, yeah, well, it's saying I'm modifying the model, so it can't save it. Okay. Um, it can't save the model back to its, um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's a great question. It's a great question. Okay, the difference is that item here is referring to an agent that's specified to this, this condition, okay? So it's telling us, okay, item refers to the thing that's in the collection, which is here a, a person, okay, the thing that's in this, in this group. This, this variable called this, which I had introduced before, what that would refer to, if I were to use that here, if I were to say this, um, I'll, I'll actually use this as a, um, suppose I were to say this, I could actually type that there. But what you'll find is that um, there's a this dot total population. Why is there, so where does total population live? That's somewhere in this model, where is that? Would, would each agent keep track of the total population? No. Who, who keeps track of the total population in this model? Yeah, in fact we see it up there. Right? Um, that's total population. That gives you a hint. This here, it's referring to the current object, the object in which this stuff is, is, is executing. This here is referring to the main, because we're, we're putting some code in here in main. 
His mane is open. That's where this population lives. So it's true that we are, when we write code here, this is referring to mane because that's where the context in which this code is running. However, within that context, we're going to be given, in turn, each agent, okay, um, specified by item and asked, okay, is this agent recovered? Is this agent recovered? Is this agent recovered? So in this context, this is referring to main, but there's code within main, which is going to be given a reference to each person in turn and say, okay, tell me whether or not they match the criteria for count recovered. And that's what, what the statement here computes. So in short, we can't use this because this refers to main here because we're in main when we're writing this code. If this code, if we were writing something instead in person, code to run in person, this would be referring to the current person, okay? But instead, it's like we are within main going through each person in turn and sort of saying, is this one good enough to be counted? Is this one, is this one gonna be counted? Is that one gonna be counted? And, and that's what that uh, expression says. So we can't use this because this refers to main. Does that make sense? Okay. So any other question on that? That's a great question. And we're gonna be talking more about some of these Java issues later on in today's session, the latter half of today's class. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, I think it's deeper, right? Which is the Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the condition that you're adding that's in deeper and that's in main. That's it's in main, yeah. Because it's it's associated with with this construct in main, it's associated with people, mm -hmm. which is for the whole population. And we're telling people how to recognize whether or not someone is going to be counted for this particular statistic. And so it's in the context of main that this whole thing is running. And it's going to be given each information about each person in the form of a reference to each person in turn called item. And you're going to use that to judge whether or not it should be counted. Does that make sense? So, so you've got this, you've got, you know, here, here's the sort of main, and you've got some behavior running here, some code. And within this behavior, this is actually pointing to the main object. And, and one of the things that we'll be doing is going through each person within the people collection and figuring out, is this person to be counted? Is that person to be counted? And that's based on using item to refer to each person in this kind of, st on the stage, so to speak. So item is gonna first point to this one, and then after you've determined whether or not this expression is true, it's gonna point to that one, and then it's gonna point to this one, and so on in turn. And so, um, in short, item here is kind of the name it's going to be using. That's the name that any logic creators ch chose for whatever reason to refer to the, the, the agent within this collection when you're specifying this condition. And people is just a variable. Pe yeah, people is, is a variable. It, it happens to be a population variable. So it's a, if, if we click here, you know, it's, it's a population of replicated objects. So it's a collection of, uh, that, that holds all these people sort of stage, as it were, um, holds all these people that are being considered. And if we, and this, the statistics basically provide us a way of going through each of those people and here establishing some criteria for whether or not they should be counted. Later, to go through them and average some, some quantity associated with each person or take the max or take the min. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So... So this is counting now whether or not someone is recovered, okay? Um, so I'm going to go, um, so we put that there, and now what we have is, um, is the uh, a population and then a statistic that we can invoke or a statistic that we can make use of, okay? So we name this count, count recovered. And then I'd like to now run this, okay? Um, so I'd like to run the model. Um, 
now that we did that, um, in order to, we're gonna have to restart it in order to sort of have it recognize that change. So we could run it in any number of different ways. I'll run it this way, boom. Um, and it's going to run here. And what you'll see is if you click here, it actually now gives us a running total for the statistic we computed. It's saying count recovered is such and such. Um, and it's keeping track of that live, so to speak, right? Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a nifty thing, but it's really only giving it to us at the current time, right? It's not, it's not giving it to us, you know, in a tabulated list over time. To do that, we're gonna need to use another mechanism. And the mechanism is, is a data set, okay? Um, but this does provide a way of getting some feedback on particular statistics. Uh, incidentally, if I wasn't looking at this, this thing is not being recorded. This thing, right now, there's nothing calling that statistic. It's only when I'm looking at this, whoa, um, that, uh, that this thing is actually being called right now. We're gonna take a look at a mechanism that will force this thing to be called periodically, okay? And we'll, we'll display the results. But anyway, that's a statistic you can define. And you could imagine defining a similar statistic, for example, for um, uh, not just for counting the number recovered, but counting the number susceptible, counting the number infectious, and the number recovered. Um, bear in mind that each of them comes with a certain, a certain cost. And later in this session, when we're going, going in Java, we're going to, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go down and we're going to look at the code associated with this. What's really going on under the hood that's computing this? And we'll actually see it's looping through the population. It's doing a loop through the population and applying this criteria. Yeah. Is there, would there be some For way each. to um, tie a specific time along with, so we're, we're yeah. getting counts, right. but is there a way to tie the specific time with that? Yes. So that we compare different We're going to do that now. Okay. We're going to do it exactly now. And that's why I was saying, I was emphasizing, look, this is great that when you're running it, it gives you the current value, but how do we want to regularly report it so we can keep track of its trajectory over time, how it changed over time? That is what we'll look at next year, okay? Okay, so uh, great question. Let's, let's take a look at this now. Um, so what I'd like you to do is drag a time plot. So if you go over to the, to the left, or to the right-hand side, so we have to call up our, our palette and it's down here. Hey, come on, stop bugging me. Um, okay, I know you're not happy about it, but you gotta bear with it. Uh, okay, so we go there and we have to go to present, excuse me, analysis, it's under analysis, and we have to drag this in to the screen, okay? So we dragged in a time plot, okay? So again, that was, I, I viewed this palette, I went to the analysis tab, and I dragged in a time plot. Now. This time plot, um, we're going to now, um, so I suggested enlarge it, and we're gonna basically get it to plot some values, okay? Um, so what we have here is this plot, and you can see this a number of pieces of information is best by, how big an amount of time over which you want to display things. So here it's 100 time units. Um, what's the scale vertically on it? Um, whether this should be updated automatically or, or not. Um, we're gonna focus right now on adding a data item, okay? So you do add this add plus add data item, okay? Now, um, uh, any logic used to be more restrictive about this, but what you, can, what you can do here is either specify a data set or a value to plot, okay? Data sets are, are special. They're a, they're a general purpose way of accumulating information in a very flexible fashion. They could accumulate statistics, but they could also accumulate a lot of things you manually compute. Can you use the data sets to like CSV Yes, and I'll show you exactly how to do that. There's some code within this lecture to do that. And anyone who got the preliminary lecture notes, uh, you can flip forward to some, uh, a, a number of slides and you'll see that, see that code if you want to see how to do it. Um, so here we're going to specify a value, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say people dot, so 
So we're asking people now. We're saying, hey, people collection, do something for us, okay? Computer value or perform some tasks. And there's a lot of things it can do. But one of the things is something that we told it how to do. And who can spot it? One of those things is unlike the others. One of those things is something we taught it how to do. We gave it a name, and it's in there. Our name is recorded for posterity here, that we gave it. And where is that name? There. Count record or recovery. That's it. Any logic doesn't ship with a thing called count recovered for every for every known that it knows about for every collection. Count recovered is there because we declared it as a statistic. Okay? So we can count them. Now, what are these things? What what are these things that are shown here? These are what? In the terminology I've introduced for Java, these are are these objects? Are they properties of an object? Are they are they variables? They are, they are, ladies and gentlemen, methods. These are things that it can compute. Um, things we can ask it to either compute a value or do something or in bad stuff above. Normally bad stuff. Okay, so here, count recovered, that's a method. We defined it as a statistic, but in truth or not, the truth is that it the naked truth is that it's simply a method, okay? So we can say people.count recovered, okay? Count recovered. Boom. There we go. Open and close parens because it doesn't take any parameters. There's no arguments to give it. It doesn't need to know any information from us to do its job. So we just say, go count the number recovered, it doesn't need any information, we say go figure, it goes figures and gives us a value. Okay, so we specified that, okay? Um, so we told it how to call. So this is just a reference people and we'd say, hey, you people collection, count the number that are susceptible. And it says, very good. So yes. Precisely. Well, okay. No. So the statistic, statistic is there ready to be used at any point. By itself, defining it does not lead it to be used. Defining it makes it a resource that's available in case uh, a chart wants to use it or a data set wants to call it. Or in case we, we in the interface, click on that that little icon for, the per, for people and it needs to show us the statistics. Okay, so yes, uh, we'll we'll see exactly that, and I'll I'll sh I'll show you. Um, so this is counting the number that match some criteria. The others will take averages. For example, we could take an average over the age of the population, the average over the income, or the, the max income, or the min income, or whatever. And so it knows how to do these sorts of things. Now, what it doesn't know how to, what there's no built-in thing for is the standard deviation or whatever to do that. We could write it ourselves, and we'll see how to do that. Okay, but but these are all yeah. So when you say it's, it's only used when it's called. It's still in the background counting the and recording the value. Only display it when we. Okay. So so um, let's let's uh, be clear um, here. We just changed this so I have a time plot. Okay. Um, if if I got rid of this time plot. Okay. I'm just gonna do this uh, to, to make my point clear. And if I were to run this model, so I can go look at this people thing and you notice there's a statistic called count recovered, right? That statistic says it knows how to to satisfy a request for something called the count of recovered. Okay? Count recovered. If asked it knows how to do that job counting the number of people that match this criteria. If I were to now run this model and um, and it's running, right? That actually is not being called right now because there's nobody right now who's asking for it, okay? It's just a, it's a potential thing. It's there in case it needs it. Now if I click on this, 
Now it's being called. Woo, it's being called every who knows how long. I mean, it's probably every certain number of events it's updating this thing. It's, it's actually being called now. If I close this, it's actually no longer being called because no one's asking for it, okay? It's there, it's ready to be called, it knows how to do it. It's a capability of that collection to count recovered, but nobody's calling it right now. Now, if I go and I put back, again, if I double click, if I click on this, now it's being called because the interface is such that it demands, hey, give me all your statistics. It says, yes, sir, and it just puts them out, just like that. Um, if I were to go put this time plot back in, and I will do that, um, boom. Now this thing calls count recovered, right? So if I were to run this, you'll notice it says, okay, um, uh, this thing is uh, updated automatically every time unit, recurrence time one, okay? And it's got a time window of 100. If I were to run this now, now it's gonna be called. It's gonna be called every exactly one time unit. Now it's being called, see that? Um, so uh, it's running and I'll speed it up. Hey, hey, why, why aren't you updating here? Um, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Hey, look at that, it's scrolling away. What's going on there, anyone have a clue? There actually is a very good reason for what we just observed. Why is it flat? Okay, let's run that again. Okay, it goes, oh, okay, okay. Um, Yeah, so there's, there's a, I, I think actually that was a somewhat, um, somewhat unusual case where it probably died out. Um, there, was, there was sort of a thing, I mean, the effect should died out. But in any case, this, this time it actually took off and eventually everyone was recovered. See that? Okay, so here it's, it's every time unit, exactly, it's calling and saying, give me the number count recovered, give me the number count recovered, give me the number. So now that statistic is being used. But I want to assure you, if you define 10 statistics, count recovered, susceptible, count effective, the max, of incomes, the min of income, the average of whatever, put them all in there. Unless you use them, they're not going to have any cost. Basically. They're just capability. They're just abilities that if you request it from a chart, it'll compute it. If you don't, it won't. Does that make sense? And, and if, you, if you go click on this thing here, it, it's going to compute it there. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, so these are ways of adding custom computations, custom, custom types of statistics to this population so we can request them. We have the flexibility to request them. And we've just seen with a time plot, that's one, that, well, that's one place where we can consume these and, and use them. Now, um, okay, so, uh, right. So what I'd like you to do is stop that simulation. I'd like you to change the width of the time window. Um, you'll notice that that plot was scrolling over. You don't have to do this, but I'll, I'll just I illustrate it here. So I'm running this, boom. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sp speed this up. You'll notice, watch this. Okay, so it's, it's doing this. It's not scrolling yet horizontally, right? But now it's scrolling. And that's because there's a width of 100s, but between here 100 and 200, because it's a total width of 100. So if you go to properties of this time plot, you'll notice that it says time window 100, right? Um, so if you did time window 200, given that the overall simulation is 200 long, um, which I'll tell you but not prove, um, and you were to run it, um, we can set it in max max um, mode there then um, it's, it's showing it. Um, it's not scrolling, but it's still only displaying it from 100 long. So there's two different things here going on. One thing is a time window. Hmm? And then there's this thing down at the bottom. See, there's this display and latest samples. Those are two different things. One is the width of that amount of time it shows, and then the second issue is how many samples to show, okay? So here we really want, say, both to be 200 to create a full graph of the thing. So I'm gonna run this again, and run it, and we'll speed it up. 
Okay. Okay. Now it ran out to 200, and all the samples are shown. Okay. So those are two separate things. This sort of time width on the one hand. I'll, I'll just show them again. Time width, the time window, in other words. And then on the other, this display up to n samples. Okay. So those are two different uh, components. Now, um, right, this captures the full time range. Okay. So one thing you can do, incidentally, is you can do copy. Now, one thing you can do is copy the chart image here. Maybe you want to do that, and who knows? Maybe, maybe you have an Excel sheet that the cap, you know, you want to capture various analysis artifacts. So maybe you want to do that. But another thing you can do is copy all. And what that copies is, what do you think? That copies the data. Okay. So earlier it was asked, what if I want to accumulate that information? I just don't want it to show me count recovered at any one point in time. I want it to show me count recovered over a longer period of time. This is a way to do it. Why is this, why is this, remember earlier we had, we had this sort of thing for that original variable. Why is it this is like on integers only, 20, 21, 22? Where, where do we specify that? Where do we specify that? It stands in front of you. For time, yeah. So let's change it. You know, just, I mean, you don't have to do this. I'll, I'll do it just to prove the point. I'm going to make it recurrence time of two, okay? Um, obviously, you can make your recurrence time of 0 0.05 or whatever. Because remember, in any logic in general, you've got this continuous time, so it will do it as finely as you want. That's just another event, right? It's just another event. And every, and if it makes that event every 0.05, every 0.05 will wake up and say, give me the count recovered. Give me the count recovered. OK, so here we go. Compute this. OK, um, run it. Boom. Copy all from there. And now let's paste that, right? OK, so I'm. I'm moving it over here, paste, boom. Okay, now it's every two, right? So that's the, that's the recurrence time here. So this, this statistic is being called now every two time steps, where before it was called every one, and that was set by the recurrence time. Note that, that by doing this copy all, it, it actually mentions something about data sets. I think behind the scenes here, there's, there's actually secretly a data set. We will look at building our own explicit data sets here in just a minute, OK? Uh, just a few minutes. So, so in short, the recurrence time associated with this plot, we saw three major um, parameters I wanted to draw your attention to. The first was the time window. Over what period of time, uh, duration of time, do you want this plot to appear? A second issue was how many samples to include in there. In both cases, we used 200 because the samples were every time unit. And so the amount of time, count for the amount of time is just the same as the count of samples. If the samples were every two time units, it might be 200 time window and 100 samples. So those are two types of parameters I want to emphasize. The other is this recurrence time here. That's how frequently to sample it. Okay. So, so we have those things. And of course, what it's plotting is dictated by here. Okay. Um, okay. So, so let's, um, uh, let's, let's, let's just tweak this a little bit. What, let's go back to person just to emphasize these, um, uh, emphasize this here. What I'd like to do is add in another statistic. And let's call it count susceptible. Okay? Count susceptible. Okay? And how would I modify this to be count susceptible? What, how, how is this different? What needs to go here different from here? Yeah, exactly. So once again, it's just a count. That's why this condition thing is, is used here. But, so that's. That we'll use directly, but this has to be person dot. And by the way, you notice if if you do person dot, it will fill on the appropriate thing for person. 
This is susceptibility with respect to person, because there could be susceptibility with respect to deer, or with respect to elephants, or with respect to mice, or whatever. Okay, so, so these are our little expressions, and now, since we, now we have a new statistic, but we aren't calling it yet, so let's go add another data item to this chart, and for this, again, we're gonna have value, and we're gonna do people.count susceptible, okay, boom. What do you expect to see here when I run this thing? How will it be different? What do you think? Well, let's run it. Yeah. Okay. And if we were to copy this, you could do copy all. And you can export it over here. And hey, come on. And now it gives us. Um, it has data set title, it doesn't, doesn't fill those in. Um, but uh, the first of these is gonna be the recovered, the second of these is going to be the susceptible. Um, and this, of course, is the time. Okay, so, so here we can have a, a chart that's pieced together out of components. Um, a third thing that we could add here, just while we're at it, is a data set, okay? Um, now let me just see where, yes, okay. So data sets, um, I'll introduce this concept and we'll see how they apply here. So data sets are a general purpose mechanism for storing recent values of quantities in the model or quantities of them that could be recently. And they can be exported easily using custom code. So this relates to the question earlier. How do you want to save these? It's what we call a data set two string method. That should be all cap that should be appropriately capitalized, sorry. Um, I've I've right clicked on it and I'll I'll show that uh, here. So so um, let me illustrate that. Because I know sometimes I go quickly over these things. Um so uh, let's speed this up. Right click, copy all. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, you can also copy the image, but that's the copy. Okay, um, okay. So, um, so uh, here we're going to have a. Um, okay, this is actually a, a, a slightly uh, different model. But let's suppose we we didn't want to manually copy these things. Let's suppose that we wanted to, instead of manually copying them, we wanted them to be exported directly. Okay. First of all, I'm going to show how to define a data set for this, and then I'm going to show how we would write code to export it to a file. Okay. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is go to analysis on the palette and pull in a uh, a data set. Okay. Um, so there's a data set there. You can use a vanilla data set, and for the vertical axis value. It's actually asking about two things, and we should name this. This, sh this can be data set, let's call it data set susceptible, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice that there's this checkbox here, and, and a data set has two components. Um, so it's recording pairs of numbers here, and the first pair is going to be the time, first item in the pair, first element of each pair is going to be time. The second element of each pair is going to be based on tell it where to get the value from. So it's saying, okay, tell me what to use for the vertical axis value. So we have to give it a an expression. We have to give it a quantity to use, okay? So for the vertical axis value here, we, we want to use, let's suppose we want to count the number of people that are susceptible in the population. How would we do that? What expression would I put in there? Who can speak? We did it before. We did it for the state chart. It's the same expression we used here. What's the expression? Okay, but what? <laughs> Close, but no cigar. Um, the the item 
So, so I'm glad you're thinking in your show, you know, this is not a memoryless process. I'm glad to see that. Item was used here in this context of computing the statistic. But here I'm not computing the statistic, ladies and gentlemen. Here I'm, I want to use the statistic. I want to, I want to call the statistic. I want to say, give me the count susceptible. So what do I do? People dot count susceptible. Count susceptible is a capability of people that we've added to it, right? So uh, wh how do I know that? Well, remember, we, folks, folks, look at this. People dot count susceptible. This is a capability. This is a method that is now available from people because that's the object. That's the the um, entity in the model with which we associated the statistic, right? So we have to ask people, hey, I mean, who else to ask but people? Um, we, we ask, hey, people, give us the count of susceptible because that's people's, it's with people that we associated the count statistic. So we have to insert exactly this line for this vertical axis value, okay? So basically you take People compute your compute your count of susceptible. So takes that reference and it tells it, hey, give me your count of susceptible, and it gives it back a value, and that's used for the value there. Okay. So so that's the the data set value. Okay. Um, now um, what I'd like to do here is um, let's suppose we do that. Okay. So we have this data set susceptible. Okay. I'm departing a little bit from script, but that's okay. It spices up my life. Um, and, uh, and then we want to run this experiment. So we have data set susceptible, and it's using as its vertical axis value this thing. Okay, so uh, we're going to be running this. I'm going to speed this up. And then here's data set susceptible. And you'll notice it says zero samples. There ain't nothing there. There ain't nothing there. Um, Incidentally, that means there is nothing there. Um, so, so there's no statistics. Why is that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, don't think you're you're quite out of the woods when you add that statistic. If you go back to the data set susceptible, the the default is different for a for a um, time plot. The default is actually to update it automatically. Here, it's not to update automatically as the default. We just have to do update automatically, okay? And that's what was given, as I say, as the default here. It had it, um, uh, it had it updating automatically. Just be aware with with this other one, you have to say, okay, um, update it automatically every how many time units? Okay, so let's run this thing. Okay, boom. Um, okay, come on. Okay, now if I click here, now I can see see all of that. Uh, and hey, well, okay, by now there's no susceptibles left. They're all gone. Um, you'll notice again, it starts at 100. So just like before, same basic uh, concept. We wanna keep up to a certain number of samples. Let's make it 200 samples because it's a running time of 200. Let's run this again and we'll run it out data set susceptible. Okay, come on. Boom. There we go. Um, okay. Once again, we can export these things. Um, we can, uh, okay, come on. We can either right click on this th guy, and do copy, um, or we can, let's close this. Uh, okay, yeah, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow this now. But, uh, right click and copy. You can export, but our goal, our avowed goal, you'll recall, was to export this automatically. So we're going to see how to do that. After all, it wouldn't buy us a lot if we were just computing it. Okay. So, yeah, we selected it. Okay. So we have these properties. Um, and we can have a chart. I'll, I'll just teach this, and I, I want to get to the code. But here's, the, um, here's a chart. And if we want to show the number of susceptible uh, from here, we did it before by directly calling it. We could have said data set and done count 
suscept or data set susceptible. That would be another option, data set susceptible. Um, an alternative, I'm going to actually keep this, people dot, so I'm going to, come on, um, I'm going to go back and, and put it back to what it was, and I'm going to actually add, okay, it doesn't want to, fine, count, um, count susceptible. And then I'm going to add another one here, add data item, boom. And I'm going to do data set, and I'm going to do infectious DS. That's the built-in one um, up here. And that's actually computing it as well. Okay, so now I want to run this, and it will show all A. Okay, cannot do something or other. Okay, ooh, look at that. Um, oh, okay, so, oh, it's a d I, I left it as a data set. This should be a value. Sorry, folks. Um, uh, okay, so now we have three things here. Two are direct calls to statistics. Another is a uh, is is a data set. Um, and incidentally, that data set only records the most recent n values, and so it isn't even shown uh, fully. If we want to show it, we'd have to go up here and keep the latest 200 samples. And um, oh, it says update automatically let's make it an update automatically at, at recurrence time of one and and we can um, we, get, we should be able to view these now all all there okay so there's a there's an example of sort of a graph two of these are from statistics directly one of them is from a data set but how do we export the data sets directly well this is um, um, this is something I think I'll skip to right now, and we'll come back and, and uh, point to it. Okay, so data output, uh, output to a file is simple to perform. It's easy to import into Excel and R, and the files can be readily archived. This is really important. You can save them away persistently. Six months from now, you can look back at this and, and see the runs you did. The cons of this compared to a database, for example, is it's, it's awkward to draw values and combine them from files. And there's an awkward question of whether you create a separate header for certain information that applies to all rows, or whether you duplicate that information on each row. An example would be the model version that was used to create it, or the, um, the parameter values that were used for the model. Do you repeat that in every row, or do you have a separate header for that, um, for that file? Okay, so we're going to I'm going to um, take a look at some uh, code here and see how to export this, okay? Um, and uh, later we're going to use some other code to export to the console. Okay, so um, there's two steps that we need to use to, um, to um, define the Java code. One is we have to tell it, okay, um, Bring in these certain Java, um, uh, these certain Java resources, so that we can use them. This is called importing um, from Java, and then we define the code. And uh, we'll see both of these things. So what you need to do here is in the import section. At least this is true for the earlier version of any logic. We'll see if it's not true. Let's tell you what. Let's skip that. Let's imagine that we don't do that, and we'll see what happens. Okay. So this is the code to export it. Okay, um, and for some reason it is scrolled off the left hand side, uh, not on my monitor, but on this. Um, that's discouraging. I'm not sure what's going on here because my the left side of my monitor is is significant to the left here. Um, what what you need to have here is this a T to the left of this R I um, R Y rather. Um, so. What I'd like to suggest here is that um, uh, we do this together here. And I'll be going through some Java stuff on the later part. But let's, let's put this here within the, for the main class, let's, we're going to put it in what's called the destroy code, OK? Um, which sounds exciting, if nothing else. Um, so if you go in this model to main, you'll see that under main, in general, there's a thing called destroy code. Okay, now that's not talking about real world destruction. Thank goodness, um, it's talking about what to do 
this this says basically to put you can put things here that will be invoked will be called will be performed when the main is going to go in, out of existence in other words after the model is done and you're closing it this will run okay so this is the code we're going to put here right now I'm going to put it here right now it should really be in a function so we can call it from multiple places if we wanted to we, we could see what it is easily instead of scattering it here but what we'll do here is we'll put this we'll put in a, um, something that says try here and you can actually see the code um, see the code up here okay so there's a there's a curly bracket that you can't see but you could see here okay so try and you put a curly bracket and it's good um, good style to indent and this is the code you want to put in actually okay um, so there's a thing called file out output stream now the question is is it going to complain because it doesn't know where to see it uh, file output stream no nope, see it's it's finding it here ah and it's smart enough to know where to go for it so in this version of any logic it's it's got some good smarts and we'll call it fos for file output stream and we'll do new file output stream file output stream and we'll put quotes there and we'll say file name dot tab okay and i'm going to put a, a semicolon here so what's going on here well what's going on is that I'll explain this try in just a moment, but in a few minutes. But what we're saying is, hey, give me a, a way to write to a file called filename.tab. And this is called a stream. It's, it's, it's a, uh, a channel, a conduit, in which you can put some content. It'll be put to this, uh, to this file name. It will flow to the file name, hence, hence the term stream. Okay, and it's what again, it's what it's an output to a file, and this is its name. This is actually creating an object. It's creating from scratch, as it were, an object that we can then use. And now that we've gotten this, we can actually send things to it. We can put things in this stream and it will flow to this file, okay? So that new basically says, give me, give me a new object. Give me one of these file output streams associated with this file, file name.tab, okay? So that's step one, and we're going to be flipping back and forth here, um, so pardon me. The second thing I need to do, and this is just a, uh, it's, it's a bit of extra mechanism, is I need to create what's called a print stream associated with that file, and that's, that will allow me to print to it. Before, a file output stream can have all sorts of things sent to it. This is specifically so I can send some I'm going to say print stream, and this is this is boilerplate code. You'll define this once, and then you can copy it for all your models. So we have to say print stream, and again, control space. It will fill it out for me, and it knows where to go for it. Java Java X dot print dot print stream. Okay. Oh, oh no no, that's print service. I don't want that. I want print stream. Hey, come on, give it to me. Print stream. Boom. Okay, there it goes. Um. Print stream ps equals new print stream print stream fos. Okay, so basically this is saying, hey, give me a print stream for this file output stream. Okay. Now this thing I can do something. This thing I can print my name to if I wanted to. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to print something to it. I'm going to print actually the data set, um, data set contents to it. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to say p dot print ln. That's basically print print with a uh, with a new line at the end, and then there's a data set name. Let's suppose you want to output data set susceptible. Okay. Um, uh, to this file, for example, um, and and then we say dot to string. We want to convert it to what's called a string, a sequence of, of characters. Okay, and then I say okay, and and that's basically the serious work that has to get done. Okay, um, and in fact, if you were to do this, um, 
that's essentially all the logic that's needed. So the first line gets something that knows how to output to a file. The second line gets something that knows how to print to that output file. And the third line actually sends something to it. This is what it's sending to it. That's for the heck of it. Just so you could understand the, the principle. I'm going to say p dot print ln Osgood. Um, yeah, don't don't know Osgood for your do your last name or or whatever you want to put to it. Preferably something proper. Um, not something in polite. Um, so so p dot print ln and uh, this will send something else that's very clear. We'll see where it goes next. Okay. So here I'm I'm printing various things to this. And um, and what I've got to what I've got to do here is this try basically tries to undertake this. Now, if there's a problem, we need what's called the catch block. Okay, and this is just being extra careful. Let's suppose it couldn't write to the file or something like that. We can say um, error. Um, it's uh, it, it's just going to be picky sometimes, and it's going to say you haven't washed your face. Um, okay, um, okay. It says utilities.p is not uh, visible. Okay. Oh, I need ps. Sorry, you should be ps. Sorry, folks. I, I I said p. It should be ps. Okay. Boom. Okay. Now it compiles just fine. Um, so this is kind of like it 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 doesn't want to allow us to use this code. If we didn't have this subsequent catch block. Um, it would start to complain. At least uh, that's what would happen in, in previous versions of any logic. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it starts to complain about um, we need to clean up after ourselves in case something goes wrong. So that's what we need to do. Because when you're putting things out to disk, things can go wrong. Your disk can be full. Your, uh, it may be you don't have permissions to put the file there. Maybe there's a file named that already. It may be that um, the file has characters it doesn't know how to create, you know, if you have a foreign language uh, file name or whatever. So uh, anyway, that's kind of what we have to do. Okay. Yeah. So what is what? PS? Yeah. That's the print stream. So so these these two lines basically are a bit of boilerplate to get me to the point where I can send strings, things of characters, both of these are strings, to some file. Okay? And in Java, it'd be nice if you could do it in a single line, just you can't. You have to first create a file, output string, and then print string. At least as best I'm, I'm, I'm aware. I could go and look and see if, if, if now it's possible. But um, that's, the, that's the way I know um, how to do it most easily. And so now we can print various things to it. And one of the things is our name. Another thing is, is the, uh, the value. OK. So if we were to run this now, so any questions on this? Bit puzzling, but um, it is boilerplate. You can use again and again for different data sets. So I'm just going to try running this. OK. And. We're running this here. Now, it's not going to matter at all for this part of execution. When is that code going to run? Who remembers? When is it going to run? The end. So it's really when I, when I close this that it's, it's going to be running. And it said, error. <laughs> OK, great. Um, OK, so maybe it's good we put that in there. Um, OK, so what's the error? OK, let's go take a look at what the error is. Uh, folks, this will be a bit of lessons. Um, okay, I'm going to put in this E thing here. So it actually is going to give me some information after the error. And it's probably going to be more detailed than you want to look at. But um, it's going to potentially let us diagnose what happened. Okay, so let's run it. Okay, I know what, I, I'm pretty sure I know what happened. It just doesn't let us save it to that place on disk because that place can't be touched because it's inside of any logics sort of controlled area. Okay, so close this, and look at this. It said file not found, uh, access is denied. Okay, even professors have their access denied. So we have to put the file someplace else, which is probably a good thing. We were, I was kind of wondering, where is this file going to go anyway? Um, it's going to go somewhere. Okay, so let's go put it somewhere. 
Um, uh, where should we put it? Um, well, this is going to differ uh, if you're on a PC or Mac um, where you put it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try putting it um, in the so-called root uh, of my machine. <laughs> um, so, so here, um, let, let me just see if this works, and then we'll we'll try it for each of your uh, machines. Okay, so uh, let's run this. Boom, uh, and then close it up. There we go. Boom. Okay. Um, okay. Access is denied there, so it's it's not able to uh, to put it out there. Okay. So where will it let me save it? Let me just see. I know on my machine I have a a thing called TMP. Let's let's try let's try it there. Okay. Um, and okay. Boom. 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 Okay, good. Let's let's try that. Yes, so it allowed that. So now if I got a TMP on my machine, and I'll I'll have a suggestion for you in just a second here. If I got a TMP, oops, TMP, um, and there's file name dot tab, and then if I want to open it, okay, it doesn't know how to open it. Fine, I'm gonna go to Excel and open this darn thing. Um, so Excel, fine open what should I see in this do you think but file name dot tab okay it's saying okay how do I parse this thing is this a delimited file yeah it's a delimited file it's just uh, exactly that's that's properly how it should be parsed okay there it is so this is Osgood because I put it out and these are the other things in it now for your machines where should you put it well um, basically, you need to you need to give a path here, which tells where to put it. And for each of your machines, it could be a bit different. One place you might want to look is TEMP, because a lot of machines have a sort of temporary folder where you can put things for that. Um, uh, another place may be um, a My Documents folder, where you can find the path to it by going to um, to uh, my my documents, you know, you could, um, for example, this would be in users' nates. Uh, you could put in downloads, for example, or what have you. Um, so basically, you're going to need a you're going to need a path. Now, for Macs, for PCs, you're going to use back, backslashes. And in Java and C type languages, backslash is a special character. So you have to put two of them to to mean this is a real backslash. I don't mean some other special character. I mean a real backslash. You have to put two in a row. Um, for Macs, you're not going to need, a, or Linux boxes, you're not going to need a backslash. Instead, you're going to need a forward slash uh, like this. Okay. Um, and uh, and for a Mac, uh, uh, depending on on if you're accessing it with what sort of permissions. You may be able to put it in the root folder there. Uh, you may be able to put it in users. Um, it's probably storing it in the location where the model is located. Okay, if I were you, or is this? Yeah, exactly. I, I think I think that's where it would be. You could do a find on your machine if if, if you've got a Linux box. Could do a, yeah. Uh, oh, it's in Windows uh, VM. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, you would need to to specify a place where this thing can be stored, and um, yeah, that's that's right. So if you, in fact, if you do this, so if you right click here, and I think you do um, there it is, there it is. See this? Click on the model, the project, and then you could go see where the file is, I believe. And you notice these are in the AnyLogic examples, which is a special protected place, and that's why it's giving trouble. Um, but um, you should be able to see where, where yours are. Okay. Um, yeah. And that would be like if you if we had actually saved this, if we had done save as, 
and saved this to a different place, we probably wouldn't have had this trouble with the permissions in the first place. Just wasn't allowing us to do that at first, um, probably because it thought it hadn't changed or what have you. Okay, so in any case, this was a bit of code um, to outport, output a data set, output a data set to a file. And um, within this data set, I, I should emphasize, um, so if we go look at this data set that we had created, right now we have created a um, a uh, a single uh, single uh, item in here. If you want to output multiple data sets, you would need to um, you know you'd have to have several data sets, each recording a different thing, and you could put them out in turn, which would be a little bit of a of a pain. This motivates um, some other approaches we'll be taking a look at for outputting data, um, such as to databases. Uh, or, or to sort of manually uh, put it out using the console. Uh, okay, so um, just looking back here because I skipped a couple of small things through here. I think these can be safely uh, inferred from what we've talked about. Okay, so um, what I'd like to look at now is um, uh, right. Um, so. We saw how manually we could output from data set, um, and we saw how we could declare data sets. Okay, so um, there's a couple data sets uh, that are supported by any logic. One is a so-called simple data set. It holds uh, only data, no timestamps. Another is a timed data set. It holds timestamps and values. Another is a phased data set. It has, it has pairs of values, but the first of the pair is not Another is a histogram, and here you can define bins for the data set, and basically it records how many data set points fall onto each bin. Okay, so there, there are several types of data sets that you can use out there, and you should be aware that, that any logic uh, supports several of them. And in fact, if you go and look at the at this um, um, at the, this list over here, what you'll see, for example, is there's a histogram data. And there's even a 2D histogram data set we'll be talking about, particularly in the context of uh, sensitivity analysis or calibration. Okay, so a histogram data set will record the number that fall within within bins. Okay, um, I want to talk about something else that uses code, which is outputting to console. Okay. Um, uh, so there's a um, thing you may have noticed when we ran that, and we were encountering problems with the error um, that it was saying it couldn't write to the file. Um, it put that error message somewhere. So back when I had this as um, simply file name dot tab, and I ran this, you'll notice that when this ran, um, and I were to stop it here. Uh, it, it had that error message here. And this is in console. And we've seen that before. You remember we did that sometimes when people are sending messages to another one another. It would output information on this console. And in general, it's really easy to do this. Um, there's a couple ways to do it. One is you can use this trace LN, and you just put out a string to it. Or you can use this system.out.println or system.error.println. Now these two latter ones are useful because uh, sometimes you have lower priority messages, um, which you'll do with one of them, and then sometimes there'll be higher priority messages, real errors or something, and those will be highlighted in red um, by uh, by using the system.error.println. So what I'd like to do is let's change this. So I'm I'm changing this code here. So that instead of doing trace ln, I do system dot error. Is it? Is it? Uh, yeah, it's capital S. Uh, system dot error dot print ln. Print ln. That's print with a new line after it. System dot error is to the 
systems error stream. So it's basically the stream that it sends for, for error messages. And if we do that, and we again run this and stop it, what you'll see is actually it outputs it in red here. Um, and that will be contrasted, for example, to something that's put out, you know, I'll, maybe up here I'll say, um, about to write to file, um, right? And, and that will go also to the console using trace ln, and then I'll stop that, and what you'll see is that, oh, okay, it didn't even get that far. Okay, yeah, well, fine. It, it didn't, it, it probably had trouble one of these first two things, so I'll, I'll put it up here. About to write to file, okay. Um, and what I'm actually doing here is showing how something could be used in debugging as well. Um, if you stop this, you'll see, okay, this is hit before this error occurs. So if you're trying to track down where an error occurs, you know, one thing you can do is have, for example, you can have a trace cell in there, a trace cell in there, trace cell in here, and for each one you can do, give it a different name. And this will allow you to see exactly where the error occurs um, in some sequence. So if I run this, and I would do run, and I were to stop it, what you can see is it gets to, it got to number one, but it didn't get any further. And then it experienced this, um, this, this error message here. Um, so, um, and it's helpfully give me some sort of uh, information, I guess, link there. So it got to the point where um, one of them. So these, these things of outputting to console are really helpful for actually figuring out where it's gotten to, what, where, where in the program is it running, what did it reach before it had a problem, where is a strange behavior being elicited. You can scatter those throughout your code. And uh, helpfully, you can quickly comment them out. We'll talk about comments this session, but uh, you can put two slashes before it, forward slashes, and that will comment them out, hide them, and you can re-enable them uh, by uncommenting them. Okay, so outputting to console is useful. You can output all sorts of information to console. So for example, um, we could have an event, and I'm not gonna suggest that you necessarily do this, but I could have an event here, remember events, but if I introduced an event and I had it, you know, report, um, reporting event. Um, probably I should call it reporting um, or, you know, event reporting. Um, and then at that event, I could say trace ln, you know, um, uh, people, uh, people dot count, uh, count, hey, come on, count, susceptible uh, and then I can do uh, comma you know people dot count recovered those are two statistics that I'm calling in people and I could do that periodically from this event reporting event reporting I could set for recurrence time of so this says recur once, I want it to be cyclic with a recurrence time of one. And I could run it now. And what I'll find is that as I'm running this thing at full tilt, this thing is reporting the number susceptible and the number recovered. And so if I wanted to, to use that information, I could actually go and I could copy this and I could paste this into a spreadsheet, well, okay, so <laughs> that's, that's the issue. I could paste it into something and then read it in as a tab delimited file or as a common delimited file. Um, there may also be a way in, uh, here we go, uh, text import wizard, I can use this in Excel and, hey, no, you didn't recognize it. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, boom, um, uh, delimited, yes, I want to do delimited. What's the comma? No, it's not a space, it's a comma. I don't really thought it was smarter than that. There we go, okay? So in short, I output it to the console here. How did I do that? Well, I had a little event 
in the event basically had some code that called this trace ln thing, which is talked about here. And it gave it something to print. Here, the number of susceptible and the number of recovered with a comma between them. These pluses are to paste them together as strings. And obviously, I could do an arbitrarily large number of these. And that's why it got output on the console here, like that. And then I can paste it into Excel. There's some problems with this. It's, it's easy to do, but it can be mixed with other console output. It's limited length. The console is only of a certain, certain length. And it depends on your memory to copy it, and it's less structured. Um, exporting to files automatically is uh, very convenient, um, but it requires a certain amount of mechanism here. What we're going to talk about now is output to databases. Okay. So it turns out that for most models that we build, um, while early on you might use file output, it's just not a very convenient mechanism in many cases. Uh, it's, it's a pain often to draw data from a lot of files together. Um, it, it, again, they can be overwritten easily. Um, it's not clear how to structure them if you've got metadata or data that you don't want to be repeating every row. And so we find databases a very convenient place to store data. Um, they're a lot more flexible. You can query it from diverse sources. So has anyone in here used SQL before? Okay. Uh, one or two people. Okay. So SQL is a structured query language. It's a um, very widely used language for interfacing with databases. And maybe what I'll do is, I may give a little tutorial for this class in it. Um, it's very, very widely used with databases out there. It's perhaps the widest, uh, most widely known computer language in the world. And it's used notably by a lot of non people with no computer training to query from databases to ask questions about databases. And a lot of systems support it. Um, uh, and if you're working in Excel, or you're working in R, or you're working in SPSS or SAS, um, you can use SQL to, um, to query uh, data uh, to which you have, you have access. Databases are also really easy to clean up. You can just delete whole sets of data very, very easily and in a cascading way sets of data that depend on them. And uh, for larger databases, um, you care about features like transactionality. So you care about um, if data is being put in the database that it's either put entirely or not at all. You don't get stuck with only half of it being put there in sort of a corrupt state. Um, and uh, notably, larger databases you can query from remote machines. So there's these uh, client-server databases, uh, things like Oracle, SQL Server, SQL Server for Microsoft, uh, Postgres, uh, uh, Ingress, and um, some other databases around. And you can query them from across the world. You can query them from Excel or from R, etc. And uh, someone else can maintain them for you. Uh, the cons of this is that there's a bit of programming required. You need to set up a, a database to store it. Um, so the basic needs for using a database to store your data are as follows. So on a one-time basis, you have to install a database. You can install Access on your computer or SQL Server, Desktop Edition, or MySQL, which is a popular free database, or Postgres, if you're looking for something with higher strength than that, also free. Um, and then you need to add a reference to database library. And then, during the simulation, uh, on a one-time basis, at the beginning of the simulation, you're going to open a database connection and potentially insert metadata like the model version of parameter information. That information can be stored in one table associated with the database, say a scenarios table. So there can be a scenarios table. And one of the virtues of these relational databases is there may be a scenarios table row that relates to a scenario, and then you may have a, um, a you know, um, time series table. So a scenarios table might have information on the version of the model that was used to run it, the uh, parameter assumptions, the intention of running that model, and then for each scenario, it might have a whole sequence of, of data, time series data, associated with it, maybe thousands 
Um, and what's going to happen is uh, you can insert the, the data for the scenario up front, and then during simulation, insert values into the database over time. So these, these sort of different time points, you might insert them into this table. And then at the end of the model execution, you close the database connection. It's a very clean way of storing the data. Later, you can then import that data into something like Excel or import it into R or import it into SAS or what have you and do analysis on it. Okay? Um, alternatively, you can combine data, compare data from different runs, different scenarios. For instance, this scenario might be associated with those rows. This scenario might be associated with these rows, etc. Um, so there's a variety of databases out there, a huge number that are SQL uh, supporting. Um, generally speaking, we, we uh, distinguish between databases oriented towards a uh, single user, single computer, things like MS Access, H2, which is a free database. Um, I think Derby would probably fall in that uh, category. And generally, these databases are somewhat less robust, but they're often very, very fast. And then there's databases oriented towards multiple users and multiple computers. Some of them are listed here. I guess I list Derby here, so maybe, maybe it's really in that category. Um, Oracle DB2, two of the sort of most uh, uh, most widely used and, and strongest databases out there, DB2 by IBM. MS uh, SQL Server by Microsoft and open source databases shown below. These are more robust and they support remote access. Um, all of these databases support SQL querying. So you can query an SQL to request uh, data from the databases. Um, so uh, I don't want to go into this in great detail here, but suffice it to say that when you want to make use of external Java libraries, you can do so with um, on a uh, associated with a project. If you go to the project information here, so you go to the project here and you go to dependencies, you can add in what are called jar files. These are Java archives. And they basically provide a way of pointing to libraries, external libraries of code. And generally speaking, if you want to use some database, you're going to need to refer to some Java library for database related work. Um, now, uh, database access varies by versions of any logic. Any logic professional provides built-in visual database classes. Um, but there's a very straightforward alternative, which is using what's called Java database connectivity. Um, and, and we have custom database classes, which are very small, but, but do the job, uh, which, which I'd be glad to share, uh, share with you. And um, there's basically code to execute queries or to, um, to insert um, insert database. Uh, so this is, this is some code, for example, to insert some data. So this, what this says, this is from one of my uh, students' um, students projects. Insert into some, into a, a data set table uh, information on the age group, the ethnicity, the, s the state of a given person with respect to TB infection, the time of the model, um, I'm not sure what this amount is, uh, and the simulation ID, that's a scenario ID associated with it, and then it inserts some values into that. And basically what that will do is it will populate each, each row of this. So you say insert into this database this data, and it will, it will place it into this database. Um, so the suggestion here is that you maintain metadata on the purpose of the run, the parameter settings, and the model version. and you have to be mindful, it turns out, of performance and space burdens. So if you save away most data from the, from the model runs, you'll find your database growing very large. So I've had, I've had students who save away a lot of data thinking they might need it at every you know, time unit. And then they're running thousands of scenarios, potentially, or thousands of realizations of a run, of a run or in other words, runs of the model, particular random number seeds. And the data just accumulates and accumulates. And so they've had databases that are multi-gigabyte databases where they're only using a small fraction of it. And so later they've just gone and they've blown away a lot of that data, which they don't think they'll need it. You know, uh, so they just destroy.
destroyed after the fact. And that's readily done with these databases. It's just you want to think ahead of time, realistically, what data am I going to am I going to need to stay uh, safe away? Be aware that if you're saving data, it slows it down a little bit. Um, sometimes maybe more than a little bit if you're saving it very frequently in the model. Um, and you know the advantage generally for saving away more data is that you have more flexibility, right? You can do more types of analysis, etc. Um, you don't have to rerun simulations as much. The cons are it's really large and you can get slower model operation. And generally speaking, it's best if you could use a local database. If any of you are interested in using databases with your model, I can help you set one up. And basically, I would suggest that you install um, MySQL or you install, um, if you have ready access to it, SQL Server, Desktop Edition, but right on your computer. And we could set a model up to, to report to the database. Uh, quite straightforward. Um, yeah. Yeah. Draw data from a database? Yes. Yes. In fact, there was a question about that um, from David, which um, I'd like to get to. So specifically this issue, let's suppose we had data, for example, on networks, uh, on a network. How, do, how would I impose data I have about like who's connected to who into the model. And it turns out that there's, uh, we have models that do exactly that. And you can do it from a database, draw that information from a database, or you can do it from a file, either one. And uh, I would, I'd be glad to have a little example that I could, I could show which illustrates how to do that. I mean, I have, in fact, it may even be my example models is an, is an example that does that from a database. But I could certainly show that here. Would that be interest still to people? Just to see that? Yeah? OK. Um, so uh, file is one thing. Database is another. Um, do people have a strong preference, file or database? File, OK. OK, so like a, a connection file, like a, a matrix file? Yeah, okay. So I have code for database as well. So what I could do is maybe I could do some custom code for a very simple case from a file, and then I could show the database code too. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward. And the amount of code for the file shouldn't be too much more than we just did for outputting to a file, actually. Um, what you'd need to do is you need to read it in. You need to probably save it in a, an array of some sort. And then you'd need to um, just periodically have people sort of read their current connections from this array and sort of change their connections accordingly. So it's, it's actually not, not that much. It will be actually somewhat more code, but, but not a huge amount more. OK. Um, right. Um, OK. So, right. So connection choreography, that's exactly what I'm referring to here. How do you have the agents change their connections periodically? And in fact, um, I may even use some, an example from this in a talk I'm giving here tomorrow. I was just asked if I'd give a talk about five minutes before class. I was asked if I'd give a talk tomorrow uh, that I was supposed to give next week. And one of the things in there is based on using, with any logic, connections drawn from a database to change to change the connections people have in the model. Um, that's what we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah, that's tomorrow's, tomorrow's talk. Um, so uh, I'll, be, I'll be mentioning that as one of the examples that I use. Um, so agent movement patterns can be scripted also. You can kind of choreograph agents, uh, their locations according to this, have them jump to certain locations based on this. Um, and, uh, you know, if you had, yeah, question? Okay. Um, vaccinations that needed to be delivered a certain number per unit time, you could do it. If you had people coming into the model, a certain number of, of births, for example, you could have those fed in, and then they get spread out through the years through dynamic events. Um, and uh, frequently, this data will be. Um, quantized into time units. So like it'll be every day or every year. 
say every year we have data on the number of births, and then we use dynamic events, which you may recall can be created at one time, but fire at another time to spread those throughout the, spread those throughout the year. So we might have data on, say, the number of vaccinations given the entire year. We don't know when they're given, day by day by day. And we simply schedule them at random times through the year. Okay. Um, okay, so those are some issues with databases. Um, would people, so, so I have a, a number of Java tutorials that I'm going to be giving the next couple of lectures. Um, would it be helpful for me to have a tutorial specifically on database use, where I walk through in detail models using a database, maybe show scripting with it, but also show saving away data, and uh, maybe showing something about SQL, the, the structured query language, give you a flavor of what that's, that looks like? Who, who would want to come to a tutorial if I did that? Okay, okay, Java tutorials are, we've got one in a few minutes here. Um, and there's gonna be one on Friday as well. Uh, but databases um, is, is a separate, separate issue. Um, there's the Java interface for the database, but then there's just the, the execution, um, uh, a, a sort of how do you build the database, how do you interact with it, um, how do you query it, completely outside of any logic, how do you query it to get out the data you're interested in, all those sort of good things. Um, it, if I had a piece of advice uh, for you, just a few pieces of advice, one of them would be, I would strongly suggest, if you're going to be working in this area, you think about learning some SQL, structured query language. And the reason I say that is because it will help you in manipulating large data sets wherever you are. Even if you never touch agent-based modeling again, it's a really useful language to know. Um, it's also, it will simplify certain aspects of your life um, because you'll be able to do some things with databases that are very painful to do with files and it will open up analytic possibilities for you even if you're already using tools like R or MATLAB or, um, or uh, uh, Excel. You can, do, you can do things more uh, in an easier fashion if you're using SQL. Okay. So um, I would suggest you think about using it. It's total, it has nothing to do with Java per se. Java has SQL um, libraries that, that work with SQL, but, but it's a totally different language than Java. And it's actually quite a bit simpler than Java to, to learn and to, to, to use. actually a, a fine uh, question. I mean, um, let's just, uh, so all of these databases I've listed here support the SQL standard. Okay. SQL standard, now, <laughs> I could go into this for a long time, but suffice it to say that there are slight dialects of SQL that are, that are specially supported by different vendors. So like Oracle has, has special um, operators that they will support or ways of doing things that are a little bit different from a SQL server, different, different than DB2. But they all support basically the same um, fundamental operators in, in SQL. And, and these databases here, um, Oracle, DB2, M MS SQL server, this can handle multi-terabyte data sets. 
Um, so thousands of gigabytes. Um, maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, data, of, of, of terabytes. I'm not sure about that, but, but in the terabyte range, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. Um, MySQL and Postgres is also pretty good. I don't know if it, if it gets multi-terabyte, but it can get very far up there. MySQL is a, um, is a free database that uh, generally doesn't scale that well for, um, I'd have to, have to think about sort of where the um, line would be. I, I guess if I started having dozens of gigabytes, I'd start getting a little bit concerned with MySQL and so on. We, we tried using it for some of the data I'll be talking about tomorrow. So we have um, experiments going on, as we speak even, um, where we're drawing about um, a million and a half records per person per month to go into these databases and reasonable study populations. And um, uh, I think in the course of a study we might accumulate tens maybe hundreds of gigabytes, and MySQL just wasn't cutting it for us. Uh, SQL Server did better. Uh, Oracle, I think, would be the best, but Oracle comes with a pretty steep price tag, and it also is very challenging to administer. MSQ, uh, MS SQL Server has a very nice administrative interfaces that make it easy. Um, Postgres is a pretty good free database uh, that scales pretty darn well. Um, and uh, we've had uh, pretty good luck with Postgres for, for some things. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I would say, I don't want to get into it too much, but suffice it to say that uh, these top three allow for real optimization of database performance in a way that MySQL does not. So MySQL doesn't support um, the sort of sophisticated query optimization and index optimization that some of the others do. Oracle is kind of the gold standard, I think. Oracle has is, is got really great transactional support for re record level locking or sub-record level locking. It's, it's really sophisticated for what it can do. And not all of that is likely to be needed at all for, for your purposes. But if you have access to an Oracle database that someone else is maintaining for you, that's great. Okay, um, anyway, um, so those are some comments on outputting, um, outputting data. I think what I'll do based on feedback is I'll try to have a, a session on, on, on inputting data as well. Um, what I'd like to go into now um, is uh, some aspects of Java. Um, time is running a little bit late. Um, so with people's leave, I think I'd like to, uh, to see if we could just go into this right now. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about here is uh, some very important basics with Java uh, conceptual understanding, talking about uh, values, expressions, and variables. And I'm then going to go on to talk about types of Java statements, okay? Um, so um, we've talked about methods, and methods um, are uh, support a number of, of components. I'm going to be talking now about uh, uh, one particular uh, aspect of the Java code that you see, which I hope will help you understand those expressions. So today, what we looked at, we added statistics. And if we go and we look at um, people here and how we define those statistics. What we'll find is that we added a condi uh, in this condition we defined what's called an expression. This is it's called an expression because it computes a value. What is the value that's computed by? That, that this computes? This computes what sort of value? Can anyone tell me? What possible values can this compute? Two possible values. It's either Okay, it's either, well, so when this runs, this expression saying, okay, 
a given person, get their state chart, and then it's asking, is this state active? So it's a Boolean. That is state active returns one of two things. It's a Boolean, and so it's either true or it's false. It's a value, in other words. Now, if I had added another statistic here, um, and I'm not asking you to do this, but if I had added a statistic here, um, and um, you know, if I called it, I don't know, mean age, we actually don't have age in this population right now, but if I had average here, and um, I had an expression here, uh, I could do item dot, you know, age might be their age, and it will calculate the average age. This too is an expression. It gives me a value. Okay, it. I can run this code, and it gives me a value back. I run this code, it gives me a value back. Okay, um, a value is a single quantity. It can, can't be further valued. It's quantity like true or false, or zero or ten or um, two point five. And the exact nature of it will differ depending on its so-called type. So integers, for example, might be two and minus ten, or example values, floating point values. We think they're two point four. in the population. That's a value as well, or a reference to main, a reference to a string. Okay, So these values are perhaps the most critical element that is being computed within your program. And as we see, they have a, a very close connection with variables, variable store values. Okay, um, Now, Java expressions compute values, okay? So uh, we call this sort of little formula we have here, this sort of thing here is, is, is called an expression, okay? This is called an expression. Another expression would be just, you know, three. That's an expression as well. It happens to be nothing to do for it. But these are expressions. They're expressions because they compute a value. As we say, they evaluate to a value. Okay, it's like a formula to compute a value. And you've been writing expressions outside of any logic for years. I can guarantee you. So when you were doing algebra and you wrote a plus b or a divided by b, that's a that formula is an expression. Okay, um, you've used them in Excel. You say a one plus a two in Excel equals a one plus a two. That's an expression. So Excel's Macro language is built up out of expressions. Expressions that operate on the contents of cells and use various built in formulae, etc., as well as formulae you can find in DB. Um, so these are examples of expressions. Yes. Some of these expressions return things of different types. 2 times 5 will return an integer of 10. 1.0 divided by 3 will return a floating point value, approximately a third. A plus B times C, well, this A plus B quantity times C, that, what that returns depends on what A and B and C are, if they're floating point or B floating point, etc. A, a greater than B will return what sort of, when evaluated, this would return what sort of type. It would be a Boolean. Yeah. Um, this dot get connected agent dot name, that's an expression. It computes a value. So we take the this reference to myself and I say get my connected agent number i. Maybe i is three. So it gets me the agent that's connected, the third agent, fourth agent that's connected to me. And then what's its name? It gives me back a reference to some string. And and that's that's the value returned by that expression. In the process of computing this, of, of, of evaluating the expression, um, in some cases there would be changes to so-called program state. Um, and, and so in other words, it may 
update something. So sometimes in computing an expression, there's something that changes. Um, so for example, this expression might have i plus plus on it, in which case it's going to give me a value back, but it also changes uh, the variable, the value associated with the variable i. We're going to get to that later. It's kind of an advanced issue um, from the point of view of this presentation. Okay, um, so here are some common Java expressions. So there's a set of Java expressions that are literal, so they're already the values directly. And then there's expressions that are comparison expressions, like those. Um, you'll notice that this A equals equals B. This is one of the bigger trip-ups for beginners in Java and C-like languages. Uh, languages like C, C++, Java. Um, this uh, objective C. A equals equals B is, is a test. Are A and B equal or not? It returns either true or false. Just as that A greater than B returns true or false. We distinguish that from A equals B, which means give A the value that's in B. The value should A should become the value that, that B had or has. Um, and then there's some mathematical operators. Um, that can be used for expressions. So a plus b, a minus b, a divided by b, a times b. Um, and sometimes, confusingly, Java overrides these things. So plus can be a mathematical operator, or it can mean put two strings together, put them append them. Okay. Now another one is dereferencing. So when you see something like a dot b, what that's saying is okay. Take the reference A and then get the field or method, you know, there's a property or method um, called, uh, called B. Okay? Um, so, uh, for example, we, we saw that, um, we see that right down here um, at this dot get main. So, whatever A is, whatever this refers to, we want to call get main on that. Um, here's a ternary operator. We saw this before. Um, so we have some predicate, question mark, A colon B. What this is saying is if the predicate is true, we use A, otherwise we use B. That's an expression. It evaluates to a value, and it's either the value A or the value B. Um, which of those it is depends on whether this predicate is true or false. So, you know, uh, the predicate may test, for example, what's the sex of the person, if the male will return one thing, female will return another thing, the other thing. Um, and then there's some of these expressions that cause changes. So A equals B is an expression that computes a value, whatever is in B, but it also changes A in the process. A plus plus changes A, but returns the value before it And then a method call, like this, this dot get main might change something depending what's in this method, but it returns a value. In this case, it returns the main reference to main associated with this. Okay, um, okay so um, here's some additional operators you'll see. A and and B. So this is a logical and. So this should be a Boolean and that should be evaluate to a Boolean. And it returns true if and only if A and B are both true. Evaluate them true. Um, a or B is a logical or. So A uh, and then two vertical bars B. And so it's actually testing, okay, is, is A, um, is either A true or B true? And exclamation point A is a logical not. It means is it not true? Okay. Um, then there's a, an operator, uh, it's an indexing operator. 
separation because different languages learn with different things. And um, uh, generally speaking, for a lot of engineering-oriented languages like MATLAB, they'll start with they'll start with zero. Um, does Mathematica start with one? Sorry. Does it start with one? Okay. So I get confused between MATLAB, Mathematica, and Maple. Um, I use all three. I forget which one starts with one. Which, which is yeah. I thought MATLAB starts with zero and Mathematica starts with one. But uh, in any case, whatever. You basically check check before you write code for it, which it starts with. Um, uh, this is this is a method call operator. If you have f being the name of some method, you call it. With two and three as arguments, those pass two values to it, two and then three as, as, as parameters, so to speak. And then if you have strings, anyway, you, you do a plus, which you will compacting them. So if A is uh, you know, foo and, and B is, uh, square B is bar, this will create a foo bar. Um, so it'll put it all together in, in one string. Um, so one's a prefix and one's a suffix of the subsequent string. Okay, so when you're reading expressions, a tremendous amount of what you'll see in Java code is just expressions, okay? And what I'm hoping that you come out of with today's from today's lecture is some understanding of how to recognize the expressions and how to understand what they do. We're gonna further talk about, and maybe today, maybe Friday, statements. And statements are, a lot of what's in a statement is built up out of expressions. Not all, but a lot. So expressions are key to understand the meaning of programs. And the key is to remember they compute values, OK? Um, they may do other things in the way, like changing things, but they compute values. So if you see an expression like this, I've tried to color code it about the order in which it's executed. So you have to start looking left to right, OK? So I have this reference A, and then I ask of A, I call its get connected agent method with this argument i. So I'm asking for its i minus one, excuse me, plus one um, uh, agent to which it's connected. So if i were zero, it would be its first connection, conceptually speaking. Um, and if i were two, it would be or one, it would be its second connection. So I'm gonna consider I have this reference A, I get its connection, that gives me back a reference to some person out there. I call this to get that person's name, and then I call, then I ask for its length, the length of that name. And that gives me back a value. Right? Um, it does many steps on the way, but each of these steps is just computing a value. And then it uses that value, like this value here, Get call get connect agent gets back a value. It's a reference to some other person. Calls that to get the name, and then that's about a reference to a string, and it calls and it gets it one okay, as, as a property that, that's strong. So expressions like this are routinely strung together in this way, and you have to learn to get comfortable with kind of reading them from left to right, kind of innermost to outermost, and. Um, this is where a lot of, um, you have to think through in sort of a mechanistic way, okay, what's getting computed each step to, to, to understand what's computed by the whole thing. You have to kind of a ask yourself, okay, what's getting computed as you're going along here so that when I get this value back at the end, what does it relate to? This value at the end, length, has, it's not getting anything with the length of A directly. Instead, it's getting the length of the name of the i connected, i plus one's connected agent of, of it. Mm -hmm. And you, to reason that through, you have to you have to go uh, step by step. Okay, so this that's about expressions and values. Expressions compute values, and um, when we look at code, we're going to try to understand what those expressions do. So if we go and we look at the code that we created today and we look at that, for example, those statistics, these are expressions. They are computing a value. The value they are computing is a Boolean. And we are asking again, I, I argued before, that we're asking for, we're considering a given person in the population. 
We know the statistic is being chunking through and being applied to each person in turn. This is the current person. We're asking for their state chart. And of that state chart, we're asking, okay, what is this current state person not recovered active right now? So that's an example of, of an expression there. This item dot age, the average of item dot age, um, this is an expression, okay, it's the person's age. Um, so the value of this is their, their age, okay? Yes? Well, okay, so I think um, you could, so it's true that you want to, um, I'm going to need to distinguish two types of, of sort of uh, the orders in which you, do, you want to think about it. So it's true that to understand what you're trying to do, it's important to, to think from, okay, big picture, what do I need here, right? So if I wanted to go compose these statements, if I wanted to put this together, if I, if I had a general need to compute the length of the ith connected person's name, mm -hmm. I would start with an understanding of that need. And then I'd say, okay, how am I going to go, go about this? How, how am I going to get there? And to go about it, I'd have to be thinking mechanistically in a process, okay, what do I have now? And how am I going to get to where I need to, to go, you know, to get that information? So what I've got now is A, and suppose I know I want to get the length of that person's, uh, of the name of that person's I plus one connection. Okay, if I've got A, first I have to get a reference to that person to whom they're connected, and then I have to ask for their name. And then I have to ask for the length of that. That's right. And so I may have a high level understanding of what I want to accomplish. But generally speaking, in thinking about how I get there, I have to do it in a sort of step-by-step -step way of building up, as it were, the different pieces to it. Does that make sense? Now, it's true that sometimes um, I go in a stepwise way the other way. Like I'll say, OK, so I know how to get the length of a name. How am I just going to get this name whose length I need? And then I say, well, OK, um, I know how to get the name if I had a person's reference to a person. So I'm gonna, how am I going to get that person's, re the reference to the person? And then I, I could think of it sort of going back, chaining back that way. That's a legitimate way to do it. It's just in terms of how it's executed, how it actually performs this, it's in this kind of way left to right sort of building up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so here, like, yes, I want a thing that will count me the number of susceptible. How am I going to do it? Well, um, it may be useful to think of it, OK, I need a true or false thing. How am I going to get? get it to, um, to compute whether it's true or false. Well, I'm going to be asking, is the state active? And what am I going to ask if the state active? Well, I have to ask a state chart. And whose state chart? Well, it has to be the item that's given to me. So uh, yeah, of, of the person involved. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's like you're saying the person, yeah. I care about the person. Yeah. Now, I'm the state chart. Now, I'm going to get some specific information. Yeah, so, so I guess I want to distinguish between um, between what order it's, it's sort of uh, executed as it's occurring. Um, like, what is this going to give me? Like, OK, so I could look at this and I could say, what is this going to give me? I, I'm looking at your code and I'm saying, what is he trying to do there, right? To do that, I need to read sort of left to right in this mechanistic way, right? Um, and to be confident that what I put down is correct, I need to think in this mechanistic way. Um, but to figure out what goes here, you're absolutely correct that often I'll say, okay, what do I need and how am I going to get there? Okay, first let me figure out, um, so, so the analogy that was given in, the, in one 1980s book on programming was, 
Assume for a moment that you have a big brother or big sister um, who can solve some problem for you. Think in a stepwise way, okay, um, what do you know how to do now? And just imagine they'll take care of the rest. So focus on that thing you know how to do. What is it you know how to do? And maybe what you know how to do is to ask if a certain state is active. And put aside for the moment how you're going to get the state chart associated with it. Okay. Now that we figure out how we're going to ask if a certain state in a state chart is active, how am I going to get the state chart I need, right? Um, um, so you break it down in a successive way into smaller and smaller pieces in short. And that is often this backwards process because you know where I'm going to go and then I kind of um, figure, okay, well, I know I've got to get there. So kind of what's the next step back from that? What's the next step back? If only I knew how to do that, how am I going to do that? Okay, and, and you sort of wind your way back. And sometimes you find yourself going back many levels, and sometimes you find yourself only going back a few levels. And then it all kind of makes sense. Oh, okay. And often what you're thinking at each stage is, okay, what information do I have? And can, how can I use that to get this thing, right? And so you're kind of working your way back. So in short, to reason through what it's doing, you need to think mechanistically. To get that expression, often you do think back like that. So great question, fantastic question. Any other question on that? Okay. Um, incidentally, I would, I would argue that the thought processes that you go through there are not terribly different from some of those. Like if I asked you, okay, sit down and create a system dynamics model that shows x, y, or z. You're going to need to be thinking about, okay, where do I need to go? I've got these pieces. What do I have to do? Okay, I kind of know how to do this part. Let me do that. And then, okay, there's got to be some way to... So, so in a way, that whole design, th this is an issue of, of the design process writ large, rather than just Java code in any way. Okay, so uh, any other questions about Java expressions before I go on to variables? Because there's a, a very close relationship here. And I think it's really important to, to ground you with variables. Okay, so variables are names. And variables denote, or have a name associated with them. And variables denote locations that contain a value. A variable, in short, is a name we can use to refer to a value. Okay? Um, now, there's some exceptions uh, to this, but that will cover 99% and the others are more advanced um, concepts um, or convenience issues where it could be that way, but it doesn't happen. Okay. So variables are associated with types. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, values are associated with types. And when you declare a so-called declare a variable, when you state, I want a variable to hold a value, you have to specify what types of values can go in there. Okay. So you have to say, this can hold a double. This can hold an int. This can hold a boolean. This can hold a reference. String. This can hold a reference to a person. This can hold a reference to any object, person or deer or, or mosquito or what have you. Okay? And so we talk about declaring a value. We indicate its name and its type. And we may indicate its initial value. We may say, I want this to be in there originally. A variable's value can change over time. Um, and uh, the location. Therefore, the contents of the location change over time. They hold different, it holds different values over time. So if we were to go into some of our models and look at the code, we'd see a lot of declarations of, of variables. So here, for example, is main m equals get main. Um, double x equals get x. Double y equals get y. These are declaring variables. Okay? So this, this thing here on the far left is the type says what sorts of values can go into the location associated with that variable. There's then the name of the variable, your m. Mm -hmm. And then this thing after the equal sign is just the initial value of that variable. So this is, this is saying there's a thing called x, it's a location, and it can store doubles, and this is where you get its initial value, get x. This thing called y, So um, 
here we have uh, variables uh, defined. Okay. Now, now um, we can have expressions that denote location. This, this, this is the most subtle thing we'll be talking about probably today. Expressions can denote location. Okay. So one type of expression that can denote a location is, is a is a variable name. But we can have other things that denote locations, like this dot color. Color can be the variable name associated with this, and this dot color is a reference to that, to that same location associated with that variable color in, my, in the object referred to by, by this, in my color. P dot ethnicity is the location associated with ethnicity variable in, in P. This dot get main dot population size is a reference to the location associated with a population size variable in my main uh, the main object associated with me. Or I may have a of twenty, and that's a reference to the to the location associated with the twenty first element of this a. It's a array called a or b of, of i. Um, and if we have these expressions, we can assign to them. Okay? So we could say age equals zero. This is implicitly probably this dot age equals zero. This dot color equals color red. This p dot ethnicity equals random ethnicity. This is assigning, it's putting a value in that location. In this case, it's, it's in this variable color referred to as part of my color. Here it's putting it into this variable called ethnicity referenced by this variable, this reference P. Okay? Again, this is just about this is just about it's just sticking it into this this location. This goes through a big process to figure out what location to stick it into. It's location associated with population size. And that sticks it in there. Okay, um, so so we call these L values. Um, these are sort of names for these locations. Okay, um, and uh, variables are important because they provide us a way of sort of naming values that can change over time. Yeah. So if you had multiple agents, so if color yeah. was a property associated with multiple agents, yeah. and you just said color equals color dot red, would that assign that? Would that assign that to all of them universally? No, because secretly what's going on is, um, so so like this age, this is a lie. See, see where it says age equals zero? Uh, that, that's, that's just a, uh, what I'm omitting there is something critical. Whose age? Implicitly, it's this dot age, okay? So if I, if I said, if I just said this, if, if I, I'm not going to do that. Okay, if you see this, um, if, if I didn't have this here, right, um, but just color equals color dot red, secretly there's a this dot. If you omit something in there, it's somebody's, well, okay, i got to be a little bit careful, because um, I'm referring to something that, that I'm going to explain here. Okay, so, so I, I realized I haven't gotten to, to one point yet, but I'm going to introduce these things here are called local variables. This is a name that's, it's just a name for a location uh, associated with this. And, and it's not my M, actually. It's just some M that's temporarily named in this, in this code here. So I actually, here, if I refer to, if I refer to C or to R, there's no this dot C and this dot R. It's just the, the C that's sort of used in this, in this code here. So, so um, if I were to change C here uh, by changing, changing it, I made it C plus plus or C minus minus or something like that. Um, if I were to change that, that's fine. It's not going to change. All it's going to change is this C. On the other hand, if I if I wanted to say like um, uh, if 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 color were a property of person, right? Um, and I said color equals color dot red. If, if this is in the person 
class, it's going to be automatically interpreted as this dot color, my color. It always has to be some particular person's color. You can't say for everyone to do it all in one step, uh, all in one statement. You can't do that. It has to be a particular person's color. Okay. Okay. Um, because this is, after all, a variable in a person, right. and it has to be a particular person. Okay. Right. Um, so if you had color associated with an elephant it, and change something for color in the person class, it wouldn't change anything no. in the no. no. and it, Right. And if you changed it for one elephant, so it wouldn't change it for the other elephant. You'd have to, if you wanted to change it for all elephants, change their color. Um, or if you wanted to make all leopards change their spots, you would have to loop over them. You'd have to say, give me each one in turn. I would say, yes, sir. And, you know, here's, here's leopard one. And you'd say, oh, isn't he pretty? Um, and you'd say, change your spot. And you'd say, yes, sir. Um, it would go off. Or I could do it when I create it. Or yeah. I could do it as I create it. Correct. 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 Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, and actually, this isn't even an L value. It's it's a it's a reference to your own object, and you can't assign to it. An L value you can assign to. That that's what distinguishes an L value. Is so you can't actually assign to this. It's a built. It's the only. It's it's almost the only built-in keyword. It's actually another called super. It's only cover covering. Sorry? You can't assign values to either one. You can't assign value to this. Oh, I see. Oh, well, okay, yeah. And on Java. It, 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 don't let me talk about the grossness of C. Um, but, uh, okay. So, Java variables are, exist in a couple sorts, okay? So, um, there's variables for so called formal parameters, which are parameters on method. There's local variables, which we just saw in that code, scattered through that code I just showed. These are local variables, so-called. Um, they're local variables, they're just declared in some code, some statements. They exist only for the duration of those statements, and then they're, they're, uh, they, uh, they disappear, um, so-called go out of scope. There's fields, or so-called instance variables, which are variables associated with objects, such as a person's age, a person's color. There's some class variables associated with a class rather than particular objects in the class. And then there's a few other types of variables, not really covered here, but are, that are quite a bit rarer. Um, so there's several types of variables. All of these variables, ladies and gentlemen, are names for location. Virtually all. Um, all those listed here are names for location. Um, and uh, so formal parameters, local parameters, class variables. They're all just names for locations that hold values. They hold values, and those values can change over time. Okay. Um, the location associated with the variable only exists for a certain length of time. Um, uh, and we talked about the scope of a variable, the region of the program that can see that variable. Um, so, um, so there's a scope. So for example, um, if we go back and we look at this code here, the scope that can see M, you can't see M up above this point. Only things after here can see M. So the scope of it is sort of all this subsequent place. N uh, if you were to put code elsewhere in this object, it couldn't see M because this is, um, this is code purely associated with this on step. So when we have a variable, you can only see it in certain certain places. And so parameters you can see within the math and local variables, you can see within a statement, um, statement with which they're enclosed. Fields, as long as the object exists, you can reference them from static class variables as long as the class is, is, is loaded. Um, okay, so because variables have locations, variables can be assigned to. Their, their values in those locations can change. Okay, so we can have A equals B, meaning the value that's in B gets put into the value that's in A. Okay, that, ver that value could be a reference, it could be a double value, it could be an integer, it could be a character. Um, and then 
then there's some variants of this. A plus equals B, A times equals B, A divided by equals B, etc. Um, plus plus A. And I'll talk about these. So these are just shorthand. These other variants are just shorthand. They could all be written in this way with some extra um, parts of the expression. But these are extra quick ways of, of writing. Um, and these variants provide a way of getting a value just before or after modifying it, um, which you have to be really careful about doing, or updating a variable based on a previous value um, and then returning the resulting value. So I'm going to explain these because you see these are fair bit. So if you have a plus plus here, um, so imagine you had a equals 3 before you, any of these, okay? So a is assigned to 3. If we have a plus plus, that is an expression, so it computes a value. It computes a value. What value does it compute? It computes 3, its current value. But, so it returns the current value of A, but increments by 1 immediately thereafter. So it evaluates the 3. The value of this expression is 3. But A itself will hold the value after this expression is done, 4. Okay? So it's going to return 3, but sort of give the next higher value to A um, in the meantime. Plus plus A pre-increments it. So here it increases A. In both cases this increases A by 1. This increases it by 1 after it gives you the result, 3. This increases by 1 before it gives you the result. So it increases by 1 from 3 to 4 and then it gives you 4. Okay. So, so post increment in other words, after it gives the value to you, this increments. Here it increments it before it gives you the value. Post decrement, it, it decreases the value after giving you the value. It decreases it from 3 to 2 after giving you the 3. Um, here it decreases it from 3 to 2 before giving you the value. So the only difference is here pre, it puts it on this side, post, it puts it on that. In both cases, these are both leads to A becoming 2. The difference is what value, does it, what does this expression evaluate to? Here, it evaluates to 2. Here, it evaluates to 3. It's just A, after both of these, A is 2. So these are pre and post experiment. Now, frankly, um, these are, I, I think they're they can be confusing and dangerous. Um, it's easy to screw up once you have um, a variety of expressions around. And I tend to avoid using these in most cases because I think it's confusing um, to have it simultaneously computing a value and changing the value of, of the variables. But you will see these in code. So um, let's just go see if there's any code here where you, where you see this. Um, okay, you don't see that right here, but what you do see is this minus equals thing. So let's go explain that. Um, here, and that's this operate and assign thing. Okay, um, so operate and assign basically updates the value first and excuse me, uh, computes a value and then assigns to it. So I should actually just give you the desugaring of these. A times equals 2 means A equals A times 2. That's what it means. So A divided by equal 3 means A equals A divided by 3. Okay. Um, a, what does this one mean? Can anyone tell me? What does A plus equals 2 mean? A equals A plus 2. That's right. So in other words, increase it by 2. Um, a minus equals 2 is A equals A minus 2. So this is just a shorthand way so you don't have to write A again. And it's clear that you're modifying it by a certain amount and, and assigning it. So these are, so they can be called operate and assign, um, assign components. Now, because you can use these with L values. You can use it here. So you could have A pointing plus plus. So what does this mean? Can anyone tell, tell me what that means? Or to make it simpler, imagine if this was A, A of 0 plus plus. What would that mean? What does that do? Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So like if this were if, if this were just by itself as part of as a statement, the only thing this does of meaning is, is it increases the zeroth element of A, in other words, the first element of A of the A array. But if it were part of a bigger thing, like if you said A, I'll just put it on the board, you know, if you were to say um, uh, A of, of zero plus plus greater than C or something like that, or B, you know, um, what this would be doing is it would say, okay, give me whatever value is there initially, and, and then it will, meanwhile, update it and we'll say, okay, but would the, is that original value greater than B or not? You know, that will set the result. So this is a way of kind of, kind of doing two things at once in a way. Um, you're sort of getting the value, remembering it and, and you know, updating it in the meantime and, and, and testing. Generally speaking, it's dangerous to use these as part of an expression because it's very easy to forget that this is being updated or to, you can imagine accidentally repeating it twice and having sort of, you know, uh, plus plus and two separate subcomponents of it. It depends on, like if you said, if you had this, excuse me, um, you know, this uh, C or this thing, actually whether or not this is even evaluated and therefore changed depends on whether or not C is true. If C is true, it won't even evaluate this. If C is false, then it's going to say, okay, well I know this is false, so let's see if this is true or not. And then it will evaluate it. And so you got to be really careful with this. I view this as bad style, basically to have this inside an expression. And you might argue, like the one place I do feel comfortable using it is something like in a statement by itself, just something like that. Now here, it's clear we're saying, okay, increment by one, the first element of A, and it's a little bit less kind of wordy or, or sort of textually confusing than writing. Because um, with this, you kind of got to look at more pieces of it. Okay, this is the same as that guy, so we're increasing it by one. This is a little bit more succinct to saying increase by one. But if you have it like this, it doesn't matter if this is here or if this is here. It, it doesn't matter because you're not relying on the value of return. All you're doing is you're, you're increasing it by one, right? Um, so in general, I would urge you to avoid these things. And even if you see them in, in any logic code, don't let it corrupt you. Um, believe me, you will see things there that will turn the software engineering professors curl as hail. Um, okay, so here, what is this guy doing here? Who can tell me? What's that second expression doing there? This is so. This is a method. This is a method call. So, so you're absolutely right. It's getting its connected. It's getting its uh, yeah, or, or third to kind of zero, one, two. It's kind of the the third one to which it's connected, and it's it's income by two. Right, it's doubling its income. Wait, so this is the it's getting these ones right. Right, and in fact, so so if this is P, it's getting its, so P has several neighbors. We could think of kind of it having, um, maybe the best way to, to think of it is P has several neighbors, right? Um, and it's getting its third neighbor, and it's doubling, and so that's a reference to somebody, right? Its third neighbor is somebody. This is returning a reference to who knows who. Who would like to be who that third person is? Have their income double? I, 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 I hope it's me. Um, hope it's me. Um, so maybe this is referring to me. This is my lucky day. And then it's doubling my income. So, so here's P. It's getting a third neighbor. And that's some person, somebody, some buyer. And it's taking its income. And it's, it's going from one number to another number, right? Um, to twice that number. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to have to uh, uh, finish up with some comments and assignment of, of references. Okay, so this is, this is a very important concept. Um, suppose we have, so I told you variables hold values. All this stuff about L values is just to help you understand that you can do things like this. You can have an expression that's quite complex and then change it out here, right? So don't get too caught up in L values. The critical thing, though, is that variables can hold values, and the values can be references. They can be references, okay? And, and folks, uh, you can have this type of expression here, a dot mother equals m, where m is a variable holding some reference to a particular person. And what this is saying is a's mother, whatever reference is used for that should be this reference, okay? Uh, the reference held in m. In other words, the value held here becomes is used for the value here, and, and that value is a reference. A's mother is now pointing to the same thing M points to. That is the most critical thing I'm trying to emphasize here. Whatever M points to, now A, A dot mother, you know, the, the mother variable at A is now pointing to that same thing here. Okay, A dot mother equals this dot get main the population two. This basically um, stores A dot, this, this basically sets the reference in a dot mother to be to refer to the third person in the population. What I what I really want to emphasize though is this key point. This will be the final point here. So when you have this assignment, it does not change in any way the the uh, value of the um, uh, you know what was originally pointed to. So if m here points to this person, and we have M, A, and its mother is here, and mother has some, no initial value. If we have that at the start here, okay, um, before this code is executing, after this first statement executes, what changes here? Can anyone tell me? What changes here? So after this first statement um, here, after A dot mother equals m, what changes? Well, it is setting a's mother's, the value in this is now pointing to whatever m is pointing to. In other words, whatever value m held, it's some reference to some person, whoever it is in the population, now becomes, is the reference held by a dot mother. Okay, so it went from this where it pointed to nothing, the null value means don't point, you're not pointing to anything. You ain't pointing to nothing. It's just pointing to nothing at all, right? And here, after setting that, it's going from pointing to nothing to pointing to the mother, to the, to the same thing m points to. And then if you said further, a dot mother, if we change it further, a dot mother equals this, what now this would be referring to is this the population. It's the third person in the population it's going to be referring to. Okay? So this is the population. It's, it's got some, I, I'm showing it here as kind of having, this is the, the array associated with it. This is the first person in the population, the second person. This is the third person. Um, in other words, the reference, the third person in the population. And this is taking, whoa, whoa. Um, whatever, yeah, so, so this whole thing is a reference to some person in the population here. And it's taking that reference and using that as the value of a dot mother. The key thing I want to emphasize here, folks, is that when you do this, when you set the mother to reference this, it doesn't change what m refers to at all, right? So, so remember, we went from this to this. Here, a dot mother is, is referring to this. And if we said further, a dot mother equals this, it doesn't change this guy at all, this person at all. All it does is it says, okay, 
formerly it had a reference here to this guy. Now this reference is instead going to be to this guy here, right? So all it's doing is it's, it's assigning a different value to this location. The value was a reference to this, and now instead it's a reference to this. This person is unchanged. Now, if that were the only reference to this person, if M didn't point to it, it might clean that up, but, but that's because nobody can reference anymore. It isn't needed. But the point is that when you do, when you have an overriding of an existing reference, it doesn't change anything uh, in the state except, you know, it changes what A dot mother references from one to another. It just changes it from referring to this person to referring to this other person, and that's, that's it. This other person may still be referred to by other people. That's, that's all fine. Um, it's just that uh, a dot mother is now referring to another, um, another component. And similarly, if at the end we were to assign a dot mother equals null, it would just change back to this. Just change to this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That is, is sort of how, value, how references are just another sort of value. They're just another sort of value that can be pointed. You can think of them as pointers, things that point to particular people in the population thing. And those and a pointer gets assigned from one from one value to another. That's it, it's just another type of value can get assigned to a variable. So we can go from no, being no, having no pointer at all to having the pointer to that one. And then it gets overridden, overwritten by a pointer to this guy here. That's all fine and good. We have um, uh, we now have a reference to, uh, to this person here in the population rather than a reference to that person. But it doesn't at all affect what M points to. It doesn't at all affect this person at all. It's just affecting what A dot mother points to. So values hold, uh, variables hold values. You can change those values. And there's a bunch of things in Java to change them using some shorthand, which seems pretty cryptic until you realize that it fits into a couple categories. Um, you know, one thing is this operate and assign thing where we just have shorthand for what, how we want to change it combined with an assignment. And there's this whole thing with pre and post increment, which are just different ways of kind of uh, getting it to, to increase it by one or decrease it by one and also return it. Uh, a value either before or after that. And, um, and then the most critical thing of all, I think, is remember, expressions compute values, learn how to read expressions left to right. And then when thinking about building expressions, you could think kind of outer to inner, kind of, OK, what do I have to, what's kind of, you know, I know where I want to get. Um, what do I need to get that? Uh, OK, I know what the last step must be. What's the step before that? What's the step before that going back? So these are Java expressions. Next time on, on Friday, after we discuss some additional material, what we're going to be going through is Java statements. And this is just a, a quick look at that. But basically, we're going to be talking about if statements, for statements, and all those sort of pieces. But largely, those are built up out of expressions. Okay. So expressions are actually more basic and more fundamental. And statements will allow you to combine expressions with updates to variables, okay? And, and uh, declarations of, of variables. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, and I will see you.